efficiency. I'll give you two background comments. One is Brad, Brad Coppathorn, who was actually in our program a couple years back, did a lot of the organization of this. So I'm kind of a mouthpiece uh, for Brad here. And uh, apropos of the uh, comments in the plenary, I think I've learned a lot more from Brad uh, than he's learned from me <laughs> by a long shot. So I start with that. Two is I am very interested in this subject. I was on the ETAC committee, which is one of the original AB32 assembly man mandated committees. and. Uh, we knew financing was important. I had a couple of summer students work on this, and I think uh, my store of knowledge has already been doubled or tripled just looking at the slides the guys are going to use, let alone the actual talk. So I'm very excited about this, uh, this session. So we're going to have kind of 10-minute introductory talks uh, by each of the panelists, uh, and then a little bit of cross-fertilization, and then open it up to the audience. We're probably just going to have people come up to the mic to ask their questions. Um, so our first speaker is John Kinney, who's chief executive at Clean Fund, a clean tech specialty finance firm with a focus on commercial energy efficiency. I actually know a lot of people in residential, but almost no one in commercial, so you've now increased my stock of contacts in that field. Obviously very interesting, much more uh, business or, uh, oriented. I also mentioned to John, I'm extremely jealous as a person in a family of four with three Stanford grads and me with a Cal degree to see he has not one, not two, but three Stanford <laughs> degrees. So John, take us, take us okay. to the lodge, or through the lodge. Uh, let me start by just, just to calibrate uh, myself. How many people in the audience know what PACE is? Okay, so mm. I'm not going to go into any details about what PACE is or, or kind of where where it's at, but uh, Clean Fund is is focused. I should say uh, that we're, we distinguish the residential PACE from the commercial PACE, uh, and PACE stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. It um, uh, started residentially, but uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and their infinite wisdom have have made it very difficult to to carry that forward. Our focus has been entirely on the commercial side, and it's it's really a very different deployment, um, and so we're we're continuing to do that. Uh, I, I, I don't think I need to spend much time on why we're, we're doing that because that's, that's why everyone's here. I mean, it's just a, it's the, the whole energy efficiency and renewable space is a huge market. It not only is important for the environment, but it's important for jobs, it's important for the economy. And, uh, and, and, and frankly, uh, the, one of the big impediments to having this happen more frequently and get these projects going has been the finance side. Uh, we should point out, you know, our, our panel, Bob and Brad and I, we were just, just commenting, we only are solving a very small piece of the problem here. Making financing available has been identified as uh, a, a number one reason why people are not doing energy efficiency projects. But I, I think as much as, as that, it's the complexity and uh, f trying to figure out what to do, all the different things that go into it. So we're just trying to knock off one of the problems, which is the, uh, the ability to finance these up front. Uh, and what, what PACE does is we're using private capital uh, to, to create a, a security uh, that allows us to attract what, what uh, are, are typically not great uh, collateral. Uh, I mean, lighting and uh, insulation and windows, it's, it's, it's frankly crappy collateral. Uh, you can't repossess it. And so figuring out, well, how do we get building owners to be able to do this and give them 100% financing up front and spread it over 20 years has, has been the real dilemma here. Uh, the government has figured out how to do this. Uh, municipal bonds have been used for a long time to, to finance the public good. Right, the government gives money to a, 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 for example, a school, and the the funds for that are repaid on property taxes by all the people that have access to that school. Uh, and this is very similar to that, but instead of a school, we're talking about commercial real estate, and it's only one it's only one building that's increasing their property taxes in exchange for the financing. Uh, and so what, what, uh, what we've done that's, that's unique is now it's, we're, we're not relying on the government to come up with the money. 
And we think that in order to truly be sustainable, you can't rely on subsidies, you can't rely on the government. The, the kind of public-private partnership that we're endorsing is, is basically using the government as the tax collector. They're our servicing agent. And if you want to be partners with the government on anything, it's having them collect taxes for you. They are really good at it. And so, so that's how we're using the government. They, they, we put a, uh, a good example is uh, we just did a, a $1.4 million project for Prologis up in San Francisco. Prologis is the largest roof owner in the world. Uh, and they're, they're doing, on their headquarters, they're doing solar, they're doing HVAC. They occupy 30% of the building, uh, and they have access to great cost of capital. But it didn't make sense for them to spend a million four on this building because they, they were only going to get 30% of the energy savings. 70% would be passed on to their tenants. So it just didn't make sense for them to put up a million four and the anticipated savings uh, if, if 30 percent of that just didn't work so we gave them a million four through the San Francisco we give San Francisco a million four to buy a bond they give it to Prologis Prologis increases their property taxes hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year that pays us uh, we're happy because now instead of being repaid based on the the savings we get paid on something that will survive foreclosure so we're not necessarily going to be paid, paid out ahead of the mortgage holder there, but even if, even if that property goes into default and is taken over by the mortgage holder and goes through foreclosure, we're going to continue to get paid by the new owner. So we essentially, our, our luxury is that we survive foreclosure. And so we're able to attract 20-year financing to do essentially 100% financing, and we, we wouldn't have been able to do that otherwise. Uh, so the, the role that we play is making what is, it's, it's kind of a complex transaction because we're having to, to get all four of these groups to work together. We're getting the energy efficiency and the renewable energy vendors. We also can do water efficiency. Uh, and they're supporting us and, and frankly selling for us because they're trying to make sales. And they're finding out that all these building owners, uh, you, you're hearing about uh, great technologies out there for reducing energy, great technologies for producing energy, uh, but they're di very difficult for commercial real estate owners to finance. And so these vendors love being able to come in and say, we've got 100% financing here. It doesn't have covenants. They like that. Uh, and it's 20 years. And if you sell the property, you don't have to pay it off. So if you have a four-year time horizon on your property and you want to do a, a, a solar project, you don't have to worry about it paying off in four years. Uh, then we work with local government and local government is the only one that can collect property taxes. So we have to go through them. And uh, we initially thought, well, they're going to love this because we're bringing money into the county to create energy improvements. We found out what they really love is they really love the jobs. These are all, it's very difficult to export an installation. These are all going to be local jobs. And so the, 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 the communities really love that. And, it, and it's budget neutral for them. And, and frankly, if, if a property owner doesn't pay their property taxes, they don't owe it to us. So it doesn't even, it's not a general obligation bond. They don't have to touch it. Uh, the property owners like this because it's, it's going to be cash flow neutral. When you take many of the projects that we're talking about here today, you see are, are 10 year or below payback. Uh, and instead of saying, well, you, you put out money and, and you get it back over five or six years, it's much easier to tell someone, hey, you don't put up anything and you're going to make money the first year. So the, pro the, the commercial property owners, it makes the decision a lot easier for them. And the same thing with uh, the other types of financing you'll, you'll hear about. Uh, the, uh, the ability to, to pass this through to the tenants is, is also a really important part of it. Uh, but it's, it's mainly just being able to, uh, to look at a project that you want to do now. You don't want to have to put it in the budget for next year. So it gets away from the capital budgeting plan. Uh, you're going to be able to finance 100% of it and do it right now. 
Uh, and the lien holder, uh, we, we have a special uh, policy uh, that we've talked a lot with Pool on it, Wells Fargo about, and others. Uh, we will only finance a commercial real estate owner if the existing first lien holder signs off on it. And we do that because we think it's really important that this be a partnership between the, the mortgage holder who is unfamiliar with tax lien financing. This is the first time this is being done on a private basis. Uh, and a real, their, their customer. And we want this to be something that creates billions of dollars of capital coming in and doesn't have the same thing happen on, that happened on the residential where you have someone that doesn't really understand it and, and, and panics. Uh, so the lien holders are looking at this as, uh, well, we've got collateral because the improvement's going on. Uh, it improves the loan to value. Uh, the debt service coverage is actually improved because now instead of having the, the building owner pay for this with, with debt or something else, the tenants are, being re, are reimbursing them for it. Uh, so, so that's why it makes sense for all those. And our job is just to, to try and make this all come together and make it simple. Because uh, for each of these people, they look at it differently. This is the Venn diagram between energy finance and commercial finance and project finance and muni finance. So it's, it, it's a, a difficult thing to, to do otherwise. Uh, so it's a different solution. Uh, it's not the only solution, but uh, uh, capital constraints are a big deal, and this solves that by giving financing. Uh, and the debt capacity gets allocated to the strategic projects instead of this. Uh, I won't go through these, but I, you know, because I already mentioned them, I think you know about PACE, uh, and that's all I need to talk about. Thanks, John. Thanks for a great start. Uh, go the other way. Our next speaker is Brad Coppathorn, who I mentioned before, was a student in my class. He's director of clean energy financing solutions at the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, I, I know uh, Jeff Bingaman's here, who uh, visited Jim Sweeney's class, and Jim said it was a test of whether or not he was saying true things about the real world. I actually had Brad as a mid-career guy after a very successful uh, banking industry career, and I can tell you in my case, the answer to that question, which I asked each and every class, was no. So, Brad, <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, I'm guessing you're all wondering uh, what have I been doing for the past three years that made me look uh, so old, given I was a student just now. But the answer to that is I started old. I spent the first 20, my, 20 years of my career doing investment banking and uh, then joined EDF about three years ago. So uh, first, just to start real quickly, Environmental Defense Fund, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we're an environmental advocacy organization, so sort of like Sierra Club. Uh, we consider ourselves a very practical environmental organization in that most or much of our work is about how do we get the rules right so that businesses can profitably deliver environmental solutions because we feel like we can make a heck of a lot more change that way than if we're just holding up protest signs generally saying no. So uh, specifically the problem that I'm working on, which is very similar to what John is doing, uh, and again, we're just trying to enable businesses to be able to solve these things. We don't have any financial stake in it. So the problem that we're trying to solve is how do we get capital available for energy efficiency and renewable projects? And I think PACE is an excellent solution, which John talked about. And, and uh, you know, I think part of it is there's a number of buildings where it's relatively easy. So for example, if you want to do a financing for this property presumably it's owned by Stanford no mortgage Stanford's a very good credit it'd be very easy to either hit up an alumni for a couple million bucks or uh, actually borrow from a bank to finance two million dollars of uh, retrofits but I sit in uh, at work in a 28 story office building and there's 10 different tenants and likely that property is owned by a bankruptcy remote limited liability corporation. There's already a very large first mortgage and if I went to my friendly banker and said, or the owner went to the friendly banker and said, I'd like to borrow $2 million to do a retrofit, the bank would say, uh, I don't really want to be subordinated to the first lien. And similar for a homeowner, uh, unless you've got a home equity line of credit, which many of us don't have in this in this era, uh, you if you want to finance a retrofit, yeah, we can all put it on our credit card, but 
That's not really a very good solution. So one idea that people have been kicking around is, and have been implementing in a lot of cases, is something called PACE, where we take advantage of one bill that always gets paid, which is the property tax bill. Another bill that always gets paid uh, is the utility bill, and that's what I generally work on. So we feel that if we can get the financing as part of the utility obligation, then all of a sudden it turns into a very, very good credit. Now there are People always ask, what's the difference between PACE and OBR, which one is better? And the way I like to answer that is I'm an environmental organization. Our goal is to get as much energy efficiency as possible. What we want to do is have as many projects be implemented. And we think of it like when you walk into a car dealer, in that every car dealer offers loans and leases. And he does that because some customers prefer one, some customers prefer the other, but he wants to sell as many cars. We think there's some pros and cons of PACE and OBR. We'd like uh, you know, building owners to have choices for both. So what is on-bill repayment? We uh, want this to be private capital to finance both energy efficiency and renewable projects. We want to become part of the tariff, so part of the rate under the tariff that you need to pay when you pay your utility bill. And the way to think about this is when you, buy, when you move into a home, when you, you know, take over ownership uh, and you call it pg and you say, I would like to get uh, electric service, you don't negotiate the price. They, you, they just turn you on and you get your first bill and generally there's eight different lines on it. You know, you owe this for that and this, this and the other thing, you know, local taxes, etc. We want the on-bill repayment obligation to be effectively the ninth line on that bill so that if you want to get electric service, you need to pay it back. We want to have this be a very open source system. So we would have uh, contractors work with uh, project developers, work with lenders, investors, and have, have the ability to do whatever go-to-market strategy they think is, makes, makes most sense for their customers, for their business model. EDF has advocated that uh, for something called bill neutrality, whereby in order for a project to be eligible, we believe you ought to have savings that exceed whatever you have to pay. So that way, when I sell my home to you, you are actually excited about the fact that there's an OBR obligation because you're paying less on your utility bill than your neighbor. Less is better than more, we generally figure. Uh, the bank lender investor does not control the utility collection process. Whatever protections are currently in place stay in place. So utilities generally don't turn people's power off when it's 100 degrees or 20 degrees. Uh, if you've got uh, medical, cert, uh, medical equipment, we don't turn your power off. We offer payment plans. All of that would continue to stay in place. We want this to be a network, not a prescribed program. I can't tell you how many times I get in a meeting with uh, various uh, government officials, utility officials, PUC types, and they start saying, okay, what's the go-to-market strategy? How do we, what's exactly the retrofit that we're gonna do? How are we gonna do that? And the answer to that is no, that's not, it's not up to uh, the government to figure that out. It's up to each company to try and figure it out. And the beauty of OBR is we're spending other people's money. So if we're spending Bank of America's money, Wells Fargo's money, Goldman Sachs's money, as a public policy person, my basic objective is I want to spend as much as I can. I want to do as many energy efficiency retrofits as I can. And, uh, you know, let's think about as flexible a program as possible. If it's government money, do we want to do a $5 million retrofit for some wealthy real estate mogul? Probably not. But if it's Goldman Sachs's money, hey, it's just more jobs, better for the environment. EDF has advocated for a third party uh, service to process payments. So in California, we've got, uh, depending on how you count, either three or four uh, investor owned utilities and a bunch of municipal utilities. We don't want the bank to have to deal with each different utility, and worse, we don't want the utility to have to deal with 15 different banks and other investors. So we would require a trust company to sit in the middle, and it's their job to figure out all of what's going on and to send PG&E a data run in the beginning of each month saying, hey, Joe owes $46, Bill owes $73, and the office building owes $11,000. Uh, one of the first banks I met with, they told me uh, that, look, don't come back with a pilot program. Don't come back with a program that uh, just covers one of the California utilities. Make sure this is big. This has got to, the way that bank is going to evaluate participating in this is based on the size of the market opportunity. There's too many government programs that start small and never grow. But if you can do something statewide, 
they said they would invest uh, and take the brain damage necessary to figure this out and try and make it happen. Uh, and we think the utilities should be paid for doing this, that they're providing a valuable service. We want to pay them in two ways. One is a fee. Uh, right now, every time a bank mails you a credit card statement or a loan statement, they have a cost. It might be two, three, four dollars. If they pay a dollar to the utility, once the utility has made their upfront investment, their marginal cost is close to zero. So if they pay a dollar, the utility gets 95 cents profit, presumably, and that's good. And then second, in California and most other states, we have uh, utilities run energy efficiency programs, and they get financial credit for the savings and effectiveness of those programs. If we've got Wells Fargo and Clean Fund and whoever out doing more projects and offering financing, the utility programs will be more effective. They should get paid. Uh, flexibility, we think, is absolutely critical to making this work. Again, I'm not, I, I've never sold an energy efficiency or a renewable project in my life. It's not up to me to figure out what the market wants, how they want to buy it, etc. So we want to create a platform. We like to think of it as Visa. Visa doesn't tell you what you're buying or how to do it. All they do is they authorize merchants and they authorize lenders, and then the market figures it out. Same thing here. Uh, so we think it's particularly critical that we you have different financing vehicles. So some people think loans make sense, leases have a lot of benefits, power purchase agreements, and then um, Bob's gonna talk about a, a very innovative financing called an energy services agreement. All those should be, credit be able to be credit enhanced by an OBR uh, program. Uh, we think this is something, and we've actually had some success so far selling this in both red and blue states. So if I go to a red state, I hide my business card, I don't talk about carbon, climate change or anything like that, but I still have a very effective sales pitch. I say, you know, do you want investment in your state? No cost to taxpayers or ratepayers, creates jobs. Uh, and uh, we let each company uh, and each vendor figure out what the best go-to-market strategy is to serve their customers without influence from those nasty political bureaucrats in Austin or whatever, st whatever state capital we're talking about. Uh, and it's been very effective. We've got a lot of interest uh, and some very conservative organizations are thinking about uh, potentially endorsing this. So we're excited about that. So where do we stand today? Uh, the PUC in California has ordered, uh, has ordered the IOUs to create non-bill repayment program just for commercial properties. Uh, we're expecting that. I have Q3 here, but we just got a new uh, ruling, so it's probably going to be more like end of Q4 at this point. Uh, we've got a little bit of uh, wood to chop in terms of making sure that ruling actually is going to be effective and this program will work as well as it should. But we're really hopeful we can be up and running uh, you know, late this year, very early next year. And what I, my message to the vendors, to the project developers and everybody else is, look, we're here in California. This is, uh, you know, this is great. But if let's say December first is the start date, don't start looking at this and thinking about it on December first, because if you go to work now and you create a pipeline of projects, so we've got a bunch of press releases that you know Wells Fargo has got a, you know, line of credit for whomever to do all kinds of projects, and we're issuing those press releases, it's really easy for me in January to run around to every other state capital in the country and say, hey, California, third-party investment, created jobs, no cost to taxpayers, no cost to ratepayers. Do you like jobs too? And we're hoping we can scale this thing and have it go viral pretty quickly if we can demonstrate that it's really working. Uh, other interesting thing is Hawaii is actually, uh, we weren't, I mean, obviously Hawaii is not a very large state, but it turns out because they are entirely uh, use diesel generation, their cost of electricity is about 37 cents. So energy efficiency and solar are actually pretty attractive. And we shipped them a little bit of information. All of a sudden they are in the process of implementing uh, a program. Uh, they may start residential, but they're actually... Uh, you know, we're making the case that, look, if you build the infrastructure, you might as well do commercial too. It won't cost you anything extra. You'll get more jobs, more fees, uh, you know, to cover your overall program costs. Might as well do it. We're hopeful that they do it. Uh, we're working in Ohio. Uh, we, I just was back in New York earlier this week, met with the governor's staff there. They're really thinking about potentially doing a commercial program. They already have a residential program that's a little bit similar to what I've been talking about, a bit different. And uh, we've got a number of other states that are interested. So we really hope we can uh, roll this out a little bit more broadly and uh, look forward to working with you all. Great. Thanks, Brad.
so uh, uh, great to uh, round out things nicely. Uh, we next have Bob Henkel, the founder and CEO of Metris Energy. He founded the company in 2009, and as Brad already indicated, it is built around an a, a innovative energy services agreement that the company uses to finance large-scale energy efficiency retrofits. Bob. Oh, great. Well, thanks while I'm finding my uh, presentation here. Brad was talking about hitting up a, a Stanford alum for some investment. If John's got three degrees, I mean, you know, <laughs> he's got to be the first person you'd go to. I'm out. <laughs> just, just saying. Yeah, hey, I want to cut. Um, well, just uh, you know, starting off, giving some background on on Metris. We are a developer, financer, and an owner of energy efficiency retrofit projects. We offer a range of financing solutions, all of which provide 100% of the upfront cost of retrofit projects. Um, the projects that we finance and implement really run the gamut in terms of the types of energy efficiency measures you'd expect to see in a retrofit project. So, lighting and control systems, as well as the replacement or upgrade of larger energy consuming equipment like boilers, chillers, furnaces. All the projects that we fund and implement are integrated retrofit projects, so multi-measure opportunities, um, usually north of a million dollars in terms of total project cost. I'd say on average uh, our projects are in the two to five million dollar range per site. Our core financing product that I'll talk about today is our efficiency services agreement which is very analogous to the traditional power purchase agreement. But instead of charging customers on a cost per unit of energy that's generated, we charge customers on a cost per unit of energy that's saved. So that can be a kilowatt hour of electricity savings, a therm of natural gas savings. Uh, it can also include water savings, getting outside of energy. It's really a cost avoidance contract, and the, the projects that we do look at both electric and thermal energy savings. Um, we are headquartered uh, in San Francisco, but do work nationwide and are part of uh, several Department of Energy programs, including the Better Buildings Challenge. We've covered a little bit, I guess, of the financing landscape so far with, with PACE, uh, but I just wanted, and I, and I am going to focus on ESAs here, but just wanted to talk a little bit about the landscape for energy efficiency financing vehicles. We recently put together an energy efficiency finance uh, infographic that looks at, really from a customer's perspective, what type of financing vehicles are available for a given retrofit project. Um, and this is something you can, you can download on our website and I have a, a link for. But if you, if you move kind of from this parking lot type scene from left to right, you start with self-funding, which you could dispute whether it's a, a financing mechanism or, or not, but it is how a lot of customers approach energy efficiency. And it's a pretty short-sighted approach for most customers. They're obviously using their own capital budget to fund a project, and that puts energy efficiency up against a lot of stiff competition. So it means projects that get done have a very short, simple payback period and usually leave a lot of energy savings on the table. As you, you keep moving from left to right, you get into more traditional efficiency financing sources, tax-exempt bonds and leases, which are very prevalent in the public sector and involve fixed uh, principal and interest type payments that are on balance sheet for customers. Then as, as you get towards the left, you start to have solutions that involve a lot more of financial and technical solutions that are integrated together, and many of them on a pay-for-performance type basis. PACE, John, uh, obviously covered. It's a fixed type payment on the property tax bill going out for longer term financing than a customer might otherwise get. Managed energy services agreements are close in some ways to what Metris offers an efficiency services agreement, but with some key differences. Under a managed energy services agreement or a MESA, the MESA provider comes in and takes over the utility bill and relationship of that with the customer, agrees with the customer on a fixed price for some of their historical energy use and receives that payment on a going forward basis from the customer. And then the MESA provider implements an efficiency project which should reduce energy consumption and then they'll be responsible for paying that hopefully lower utility bill. Um, it's, a, it's a mechanism that's worked well in some commercial real estate opportunities uh, and projects. Under an efficiency services agreement, um, at Metris, we're, we're coming in providing 100% of that upfront funding, billing customers only for realized energy savings. They continue to receive their utility bill and pay for energy that they consume, but start to receive a bill after the first quarter of operation of a project 
from Metris for the realized energy savings on really a megawatt style type services charge. Um, looking a little bit at the continuum of our involvement in a project, um, we do work up front with customers to identify what type of efficiency retrofit makes sense for their facility or in many instances a portfolio of facilities. We then either engage or work with the customer's existing energy service company, ESCO or contractor, um, doing a lot of the financial engineering alongside the technical engineering work that a, a contractor will be doing in terms of the preliminary and detailed audits. We then bring a project um, to closure by signing an efficiency services agreement with the customer. We fund that partially with equity off of our own balance sheet, but then bring in outside debt for a portion of that funding take title to the equipment and enter into efficiency services agreement terms that are usually in the five to 12 year range. Uh, most of ours have been 10 years, although we've done uh, an ESA that's 11 years. And if you compare that to power purchase agreements for, for solar or other forms of renewable, they're a lot shorter. And part of that just reflects the, the stronger underlying economics of energy efficiency. Um, once a project is operational, uh, we pay an energy service company or a contractor to do some ongoing maintenance that's over and above what a customer would typically be doing themselves. Um, we also really are looking for added energy efficiency measures during this time period. Um, because we might start a project in year zero that has a chiller and a lighting system, but in year three if we identify an opportunity to add in controls or another energy efficiency measure that becomes attractive, we can do that within the original ESA and charge the customer that same cost per kWh saved that they otherwise would have been paying. So it's, it, it really just helps make our offering more of a single point in time financing and more of an ongoing efficiency procurement program for customers. Um, Today, I uh, was asked to focus in on a case study, so I think you know, our best case study is our series of projects with BAE Systems. Um, so here you see the, really the contractual relationships as part of this program, but it applies to any of our other projects. Uh, Metris enters into the ESA directly with the customer. It lays out the efficiency measures to be implemented, the cost per kilowatt hour saved, um, and it, it discusses the measurement and verification protocols for how we're going to be billing the customer. The terms and conditions of the ESA are set and then the exhibits are really something that are project specific. So as we move to a different site for the same customer, we have the benefit of using the same terms and conditions from the previous site and are just updating the exhibits to the contract. In parallel, we're entering into really an enhanced engineering procurement and construction contract with an ESCO or a contractor. They're performing uh, the construction work, ongoing maintenance work, and the measurement and verification on a, on a project. Um, and, and this all slide just also calls out some of the promotional benefits for customers that are engaged with us in terms of uh, being part of some of the DOE and other federal programs. In terms of some of the specific sites uh, within the BAE program, there's three new sites that are in advanced stages of development, but we have four operational projects, about $8 million worth of efficiency measures have been installed across these four sites. Um, pretty good diversity in terms of mix of efficiency measures and different levels of savings too. Um, there's electricity savings, natural gas, fuel oil, across all these sites. So really it just, just shows that we're a cost avoidance type structure for customers. Um, and again, the Merrimack was our first project. The terms and conditions for that site are the same for their New Hampshire headquarters that we did most recently and are going to be the same for these other three upcoming sites. Just really to, to, to close out some of the, the benefits of efficiency service agreements for customers, I think I, I talked about a lot of these items. Obviously the avoided capital up front. A lot of customers um, think of the ESA as really a vehicle that allows them to redirect their current energy spending to more productive uses. Um, the customers are otherwise paying this money to the utility, but they free up uh, a portion of that keep some of that themselves and have lower operating expenses, but then pay for facility improvements that otherwise might not have gotten done. And BAE Systems is obviously looking at the sustainability benefits of the work they do, but a lot of the key drivers at each of the sites so far have also been 
um, facility improvements and technical matters that need to be addressed. And we're, we're still finding that as something that makes projects move more quickly. We have customers that are driven by sustainability, but right now what is what gets customers attention on a sustained basis is really when a project is linked in to say needing a new chiller for the cooling season then we're getting the customers full attention and projects move with without it it, it, it can be a longer development cycle um, and probably just the last item is our services agreement is is just that it's something that we've worked with accounting firms uh, and have have worked with customers on to ensure is an operating expense and not a capital expense for customers. Uh, the basis of our agreement is selling energy efficiency as a service on a cost per KWH save that's very equivalent to what a customer would otherwise be paying their utility. It's a variable payment. We're putting mm -hmm. our own equity into, into, into projects and taking ownership and demonstrating control of projects. So for customers, it, it makes a, a, a balance sheet type impact. Customers need to look at uh, the accounting and review this on their own, but it, it in many ways just gets to really the premise of our business, which is to make energy efficiency something that's a resource for customers, have uh, really the market view it as such and view it on par with supply side energy resources, but something that's a lot more cost effective for customers to do. So maybe with that, I'll stop. Great. It. Thanks. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, so well, Brad, as advertised and now demonstrated, we have three uh, absolute rock stars in the financing energy efficiency business here on this panel. Uh, we do have, fortunately, even with a late start, about 20 minutes for questions. I have four, and I could easily, those of you who know me, know I don't lie, I could take up all the time, but I would prefer to start with, and we had some hands coming up. The only reason I would do it is if not Ed. I'm really intrigued by the ESA because that was the model that people started with over 20 years ago and it seems to go out of favor because of the operational difficulties of establishing a baseline and establishing contingencies for weather and economic downturns and all the rest of it. How have you managed all of that and brought it back? Well, I mean, I... I Speaking to the microphone here, I think in, in, in some ways, if, if you go back a decade or two, a lot of uh, the ESAs or, you know, in, in many ways, shared saving style arrangements were being put forward by energy service companies um, that were also doing the installation and selling equipment into projects. A lot of that has stopped. A lot of the ESCOs who are now our partners really want to focus on their, their main line of business, selling equipment, doing the construction, and, and not getting involved in the financing. So that's, that, that's kind of one difference. But I think some of the things that you bring up, uh, there's more track record in the industry now, certainly with uh, the international protocols for measurement and verification being utilized, well vetted. Customers understand that, and it's pretty industry standard. But part of how we try to address it is to work up front with customers and our ESCO and contractor partners so that everyone is on the same page. I was mentioning that you know the different exhibits to our contracts which are project specific. One of them is dedicated exclusively to measurement and verification. So for each energy efficiency measure that's part of a project, we have a set of protocols and calculations that the customer gets to review ahead of time. Um, we do rely on a lot of baselines that are established as part of detailed or investment grade audits and you know try to be as transparent as possible about that but one of these facilities has a big reduction in force that it loses the contract and has happened staffing for a couple of years what yeah is to your contract? in that case that w what we agree I mean that would probably get into the operating hours baseline that's established so if a customer has been operating their facility for 7200 hours a year for the last decade on average that's something we're going to fix in there and you know, say if it, the measure is a chiller, we're gonna go put a data logger on the chiller, measure its efficiency, but that type of operational risk, you know, be it occupancy, if it's more of an office building, or you know, business risk, if it's an industrial facility, that's put on the shoulders of the customer because they're really the only ones that can bear that. So the customers we work with are ones that need to look at these agreements and say, well, you know, listen, if, I, if my business takes a downturn, you know, it's not that, uh, all of a sudden, I'm going to be able to, to, to lower some of these costs. Um, so it's, it's something that, that we work with customers up front on. This Let's go. This was a point, too, about the, uh, the uh, world leaving world. People are trying to go off, off the grid. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
Let's go a, a few back from Ed, straight to green, light green shirt, and then over here. Thank you. I, I'd like each of you to address something about the risks to the investors. I saw the, the benefits to the project um, managers and the, and the local jobs being created, but who Why don't you start, John? Front? John uh, from, uh, w w for, the, for the PACE investors, I think the, the main risk is going to be liquidity. Uh, because these are our 20-year bonds and there's not a demonstrated securitization market yet. We, we believe that that's going to be easy to demonstrate, but that's, that's the main risk people have in, in working with us. In, in the case of our services agreement, there's, there's two investors. There's, there's Metris and the outside debt provider. And maybe I'll start first with the outside debt provider. Through our structure, we really squeeze out a lot of the risk for, for a lender. Um, because as part of the project, we contractually fix with the customer the cost per KWH saved or whatever the right unit of energy savings is. So there's no price risk, if you will, on what the value is of an avoided kilowatt hour in the future for our contract, you know, very much like a PPA. Um, and we also work with contractors or ESCOs that can provide a performance guarantee. Usually, and that performance guarantee goes to Metris. And usually that's in the neighborhood of 80 to 90% of the expected savings on a project. So from a lender's perspective, um, they know what the cost per KWH saved is in each year. And they know that if the project doesn't hit a certain level of performance, there's a credit worthy energy service company that is gonna pay Metris for what the output would have been. And that really leaves the lender just with the credit risk. Um, and we do work with lenders. Um, John was talking a little bit about the collateral of equipment, and I think this is just part of energy efficiency. We own the equipment, but it's, it's not you know, like a leasing type play where we're gonna go take a chiller and roll it down the street. There's, there's some collateral value to it, and the lenders we work with understand that, but it's not on a secondary market. But really, the, the, the debt providers are just taking the customer credit risk. And there, we try to work with customers that obviously have solid credit and are gonna be a going concern for the duration of the ESA. Then the next piece of the capital stack is, is Metris and, and, and the equity risk. And we really, in, in many ways, benefit from the performance of a project over and above what the energy service company or contractor will guarantee, which we see as a pretty conservative discount. Um, energy efficiency is a lot of proven technology, so we underwrite deals to their expected performance, and that's where we make our return. So we're the, we're the, we're the last ones paid, so we're ultimately taking the risk that a project isn't going to perform up to the expected level. Well, well, right. I, I just say on the credit risk, I think on-bill repayment and PACE are two different strategies, both of which can significantly improve the credit risk, particularly if you're looking at like a shopping center or a multi-tenant office property where uh, it becomes much easier to underwrite, are the lights going to be on or is the property tax going to be paid than is the uh, capital structure of the specific property going to continue to survive. Great. Uh, over here. Yeah, I got a question. <coughs> Excuse me, my name is Bobby Kipolis. I'm from Presidio Graduate School. Um, I think inter inter I'm sorry. Uh, financing innovation is good, but I don't know, does it put enough pressure to reduce the sales cycle to, to kind of do the, reduce the transaction costs to really get these projects going? Because I think, feel like, Sometimes you're pushing the rope a little bit, and you have to kind of figure out whether it be a policy a piece lot. or something else. Yeah. How to get these projects rolling? I mean, I, I I started by saying we're only providing one element of of the solution, and our go-to-market strategy is to to work with the vendors to just allow them to have one more tool to make it easier for them to to get a building owner to be able to do a, a, a deeper retrofit than they might otherwise do. Uh, but they've got to make, they've got to make the sale. We're not going to be able to, to make the sale for them. The financing uh, has been an impediment. And so this can get rid of that one roadblock, but there's, there's plenty of others that are out there that we're all having to f figure out how to solve. Yeah, I mean, your, your question's a key one. Before Metris was Metris, it used to be part of a renewable energy finance company. And I had always been in the energy efficiency world. And when I went over to work uh, amongst people on the solar side, it blew me away that they could go and through you know Google Earth, look at a site, sketch out what the project was going to be, and have the project scope done, you know, close to what it would be in a, in a day. Energy efficiency, for better or for worse, is just 
more intimately involved with a customer's facility. And I think that makes it more important, but it makes it tough. And I think there's advancements coming along in terms of software and diagnostic systems that are allowing you to reduce that sales cycle. But right now, we're still at a point where I, at least for our deals, and I think a lot of deals, I don't see any way around kind of that two-phase audit approach where you, you likely need people on site doing a one-day walkthrough, and then you need to go back for a more detailed energy assessment. And I think diagnostic tools are gonna help shorten that cycle, but that's, that's where that cycle is going to be shortened. I don't know if it's as much on the financing side that we're going to shorten it. I think it, yeah, I think there's, there's a certain kind of, you know, minimum amount of time that's going to be required to develop an energy efficiency project from scratch. And, and a lot of that is more on the technical side. Like for us right now, if you're a customer and we go talk to you for the first time, if you're super motivated, we might have a deal closed in eight months. Um, but if you got other things going on in your business, which you probably would, it's 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 a year. Right, because I mean, maybe Brad can talk about this. The policy, the AB 1103, San Francisco Chapter 20, like local um, NYC Local 87, they all push audits on there. Hopefully, they can convert these to projects. I yeah, I mean, we um, we've been involved in some of those uh, affairs. I mean, benchmarking seems like it's an idea that has a great deal of promise. Uh, there's a company in New York called Honest Buildings that uh, is doing a lot of disclosure, just getting information out there, trying to create a B two B marketplace for this. Uh, but yeah, energy efficiency is tough. It's not quite as sexy as solar panels in general, and uh, <laughs> we're, that's why we're all working on trying to make this happen. Uh, let's start on the other side now. Um, yeah. For each of your three business models, does it make any difference if you are operating in an IOU territory, a muni territory, a community choice aggregation district, or s perhaps another model? Mm -hmm. Guessing that's probably more me. So, and I, I'm not yeah. a business <coughs> model. We're, we're a nonprofit just trying to create it. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, what we're, what we're doing this more political answer in California is we have asked uh, the PUC has ordered the IOUs to create. Uh, an on-bill repayment program in their service territories. Now, uh, what we want to have happen, again, is that you get the central entity that's going to be effectively the master servicer. It's going to be the hub where everything goes in and out of. And what we've said and been advocating very strongly for is that politically it's very hard if we order Palo Alto, LADWP, or any of the other municipal utilities to participate, that's probably not a political winner. But if we create this really shiny object, that uh, is allowing jobs to be created next door to Palo Alto, then we're obviously going to come into Palo Alto and say, hey, do you want to participate? And we want this to be set up that they can plug into the hub on exactly the same terms that PG&E does, et cetera. And then the other thing that LEWP is talking about is they only provide electricity. Uh, SoCal Gas does the gas service there. So potentially we're just going to put this on the gas bill and have them execute it. And since, since SoCal Gas is already doing it, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, and, and I guess for us, you know, part of it just gets down to what the underlying utility tariff might be. You know, if it's in an area where it's a lot lower cost to energy, it, it can make things more challenging. That, that being said, we're mm -hmm. developing some projects in Alabama with pretty low cost of electricity and no utility incentives. but. You know, in terms of utility area by utility area, it's more of what's the tariff structure like, and do they offer incentive programs that can help us do deals? But but none of those are really a, a prerequisite. So we we could do deals anywhere. Straight back here, and then light green shirt. Okay, for John, I'm wondering about your lender consent rule. How yep. many projects get stopped because the lender doesn't sign off on them? Are there some lenders who like it, and some who don't? And then, that's one question. Another one is just where do you see this going? Do you plan to offer residential services? And are there other companies out there doing this? Are they growing? Are they solid? Or is it still pretty much testing the water? Uh, well, I, I guess there are two questions there. On the, on the lender consent side, uh, there are going to be a lot of there are going to be a lot of times when a lender uh, does not believe that a project is viable, uh, or that they they don't want their particular building owner taking on any additional liabilities. And uh, not every building is going to be financeable under any circumstance. Uh, so there's a lot of times when that won't happen. We have not run into that. All of our projects we've been able to get uh, approved by uh, the big banks, Wells Fargo, uh, Bank of America, uh, City. They're, they're approving these projects when they make sense. 
and and then with regards to the uh, uh, where we're going, we really think that the residential is a different market. It's it's consumer finance, so it's not something that we're going to be pursuing. Uh, but we think that the residential side of PACE probably is going to come back at some point. Yeah, Across the aisle. Um, you know, I just say in terms of the consent issue, that's one of the reasons we decided to pursue OBR. PACE exists at first, but we believe that if you, for example, we're not going to offer legal advice to anybody, but, but we believe that if you do an ESA through on-bill repayment, then definitionally you're just providing a service and you're effectively you know, changing the service provider from just PG&E to PG&E plus Bob, then that's something that clearly should not require consent. So a building owner really ought to talk to all three of us. <laughs> <laughs> Across the aisle there, yes. Uh, representing a small city that's primarily commercial, uh, this is a good topic for me because the, the residential programs are not as important for us, the pace hasn't worked out. So I'm kind of curious about, uh, from the government perspective, is there something that you really don't want governments to do? Should they just be getting out of the way? Or are there things that cities could do that would really help uh, promote this more. I'm thinking about RICO, SECO, uh, you know, a commercial energy conservation ordinance that would require a time of sale, a time of lease, or those kind of things of energy upgrades. I would think that would help you, but I, you know, I don't. I want to make sure that we're moving in the right direction in my city. And the other question was about on-bill on financing or repayment. Uh, what about uh, water uh, utilities? Would they also be able to join in on that? I know there's some uh, pilot programs in the state for on-bill uh, financing of water efficiency measures. I just want to make sure that. They wouldn't be excluded from that. So uh, the existing program that is probably going to be created in California, uh, I think most likely will not include water on day one. I mean, I've been told that generally it's hard to meet bill, meet bill neutrality with water. And then the other issue is water is just very separate from electric and gas currently. That it, it technic theoretically it should work. It's probably just an extra layer of complexity that we ought to come back in a couple of years and try and weave in. And then in terms of, uh, you know, Disclosure, building ordinances, uh, you know, things like that. Generally, we're all those I think are incredibly helpful, and we're generally in favor of them. Our our, our view is, please stop helping us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's our 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 view to government in general is that the, these programs do do better when simplified and and left you know let the let the financing solutions happen on the private sector. Uh, the more regulation, the more help we get, the slower things go. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, from, from my perspective, there's two things that we look at. I mean, it, it can relate to what policies are put in place or just actions in general. One is, does something help create demand and get, get customers moving quickly to the earlier question? So I think if there's some ordinances in terms of mandatory energy efficiency audits and other compliance, People don't like it, but from the perspective of being out there developing projects and seeing customers that are interested in energy efficiency, customers that get that it's the right thing to do, but also know that it's something they don't have to do. Um, you know, I'm not advocating for, for big regulatory sticks, but anything that can help spur demand is helpful. And then a little bit to, to Brad's program, the other area is expanding access. Um, and access is really, you know, access to the market for us as a source of financing, because right now, Credit is a major limiting factor, um, not only for us, but for the energy efficiency market in general. I mean, part of the reason that PACE is so attractive for commercial real estate is that the way those buildings and properties are set up as limited liability companies, they're essentially unfinanceable and obviously are huge consumers of energy. So all of a sudden, you know, you might, if you look at the energy efficiency potential out there in the country, probably 50% of it is untouchable because of credit. So if something like on-bill repayment can come in and by virtue of having it attached to the meter, make those customers accessible, then we can do more deals and, and get things moving. So those, those are the types of programs we're interested in. My question is for Brad. Uh, what, uh, how are the, the utilities responding to this? The Secretary Chu said there's no free lunch. Uh, presumably, and a uh, higher, higher bill statistically would increase uh, delinquency rates. And so how, how are the utilities responding to a program like non-bill repayment? So a couple of thoughts. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, we think this should re actually reduce um, utilities' uh, bad debt. And the reason for that is, let's say, 
Uh, as a customer, I currently owe $200 each month to PG&E, and I finance an energy efficiency project, and if we have bill neutrality, my bill can not go up. It has to be the same or be lower, otherwise the project wouldn't qualify. So if I now owe 100 to PG&E and 100 to City, and I don't pay one month and then move to Nevada and they never collect, well, before PG&E lost 200, now they only lost one lost $100. So hopefully that, at least on a default risk perspective, is better. In general, uh, I, w I was op more optimistic when we put this thing together that we would get a pretty good response uh, from utilities because, again, we want to pay them fees that more than compensate them for their costs, and we are making the energy efficiency programs be more effective. Uh, there have been some utilities around the country that have been more interested than, let's say, the California utilities. And I, the California utilities have kind of been fighting us a little bit. And I, I guess the way I would express that is I think if you got them in a reflective moment over a beer at some point, uh, I, think, now you're I think many, many folks would, that, that they would say, and I would actually agree with them, that in California, we regulate the utilities pretty aggressively. And if something changes, and it turns out that that was a good thing, then generally, as regulators, we say, oh, utility, you got lucky. Whatever that benefit is, that ought to go to ratepayers. But if, this, if it goes wrong, then we say, hey, utility, you screwed up. You know, your shareholders need to pay for that. That comes out of your hide. Well, if I'm a utility in that case, I don't want change. And based on that, I think the utilities are, you know, have, we haven't gotten them on board in California yet, and we're kind of having to uh, do it against their will to some degree. And that's that is Brad being very politically correct. <laughs> All right. Let's do one more question. A question to, uh, to Bob uh, regarding the, uh, the accounting status of uh, ESA as to whether or not they qualify as offline sheet financing. There was some uh, questioning from SASB. What's the new guidelines on them and how is it going to affect the ESA going forward? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question and something that we're following pretty actively. Um, FASB, also working with the International Accounting Standards Bureau, has been working now for about four to five years on revising the lease accounting standards. They, they issued a, an exposure draft of some plan changes about two years ago and then got a lot of comments back and just recently reissued an exposure draft that now I think has about a six-month comment period. Um, I think it's probably working towards having some final standards. If things move along, there'll be standards probably within a year that would then go into place about three years from now. And you know, in terms of how that impacts our arrangements, it, at, at the moment it, it doesn't because we've been anticipating a lot of the changes that we think are coming have been telegraphed and really haven't been you know, shifting over the last year or so. So the things that are key from an accounting perspective is what's the basis of the agreement? And for a services agreement, the basis is to deliver uh, avoided kilowatt hours of electricity. And if you're doing that from a diversity of sources, just like a utility can deliver kilowatt hours from a diversity of sources, that's a positive factor. Um, if you have the ability to add in new sources and equipment that deliver that same KWH saving, savings, that's also a positive factor. The other and in many ways, separate test is does the you know owner of the agreement, in, in this case Metris, have you know sufficient demonstration of control? And the fact that we're putting in equity, um, paying for ongoing maintenance, um, those are all pretty positive factors, and we work that through with customers. Um, but it is an issue because some customers, especially with there not being certainty on the future guidance, it, it stalls discussions, and the whole leasing revisions were brought up because you know companies that run airlines don't have airline air, airplanes on their balance sheet sometimes it wasn't about renewable energy or energy efficiency but the reality is that some of these issues they're talking about do have the potential to impair solar PV agreements through PPAs and efficiency service agreements that deal with energy efficiency equipment so it's something that we're working on um, I mentioned we're part of this Better Buildings Challenge program, so there's other financial providers that we're talking to, and just making sure that you know the industry is aware of the potential implications. Great. I think we need to shut things down to yep. let the next panel come in. Uh, I, just as a